On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse, we talk with an abuse survivor named Judy. And Judy was in a 15 year fairy tale marriage with a covert narcissist. It's a story of betrayal trauma, financial abuse, infidelity, and stolen memories. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone. This is a podcast that gives a voice to survivors of domestic violence. I am Brandon Chadwick, but my friends call me Chad, and thanks for tuning in to this episode. So what is a narcissist, you may ask? Well, for the purposes of this podcast, we refer to a narcissist as anyone who has displayed a pattern of behavior that shows a limited capacity to appreciate others' perspectives. It is that simple. Now, if you have not been to our website recently, please do go there if you want to be a guest on our show. Go to NarcissistApocalypse.com. Press that guest form button. Go to our guest form page. There's a lot written there now about what we're looking for when you're on the show. And then fill out that guest form or send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com. But please do go to our website to check out all of the notes you should send us. Now, also at our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com, we have a community support button at the top of the page, and that's for our very own safe social network. Our community members are on there posting in our forums. We have integrated Zoom support meetings on there, and we do those on Wednesdays and Saturday nights. We have meditation nights. We have closure ceremonies. Our community members are on there. They're all amazing, and they're there to support you. And guess what? We also have ad-free episodes on there. I forgot to mention that. We also have bonus episodes on there. I have a bunch to put up. And just show up to our support group, and I guarantee you won't just get some support. You will also make friends in the process. So please do go to NarcissistApocalypse.com, top of the page, community support. And if you want more support, go to DomesticShelters.org. If you or someone you know are experiencing abuse, you are not alone. DomesticShelters.org offers an extensive library of articles and resources that can help you make sense of what you're experiencing, and they can connect you with local resources like shelters and find ways for you to heal and move forward. So please do go visit DomesticShelters.org to access this free resource. And... Also, a big shout out to Apple Podcasts. Apple Podcast is the creator of podcasts. That's why the word pod is in there. And if it wasn't for Apple creating this medium, we would not be able to do our show. So a big thank you to Apple for creating the podcasting medium and letting everyone here connect with each other. So big thanks. And also... Uh, A big, big thing is coming up here because it is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. This is our last Survivor Story episode before it is over and our run is on October 30th at 8 p.m. You can do it from anywhere you want. We're doing five kilometers, 3.1 miles for you people in the United States. And I will be starting mine at the base of the CN Tower. You can raise money for a shelter. You can raise money for an agency. You can raise money for an individual that is struggling and needs your help. Or you can just raise awareness. We are using the hashtag RunForDV on our social media. And I will be posting on my TikTok on the, on the night of the run. And uh, a big thanks to everyone who's going to take part in that. And now, we're almost there, everyone. We're almost there. This episode with Judy is, uh, I, guess, I think, a story that we really have never heard before. Someone that was able to keep their mask on for so long. And it's a really interesting story. It, at a certain point, it takes a twist. And I'll tell you, it's a twist that you didn't 
obviously you know it's coming, but there are so many things that happen once that unfolds and stay to the end because we, you know, Judy really lets it all hang out and, you know, Judy's struggling. And a lot of the time we have people on the show that are doing a lot better, but, but Judy had a lot happen to her when you're in a relationship for 15 years and everything seems normal for the most part, it is normal. And then it's just taken away and that person disappears in the sense of how they act completely different and uh, the lengths of, of what they did after the fact are um, scary to say the least. So a, a big thank you to Judy for taking part on on the show and Judy will be part of our community now uh, forever. So if anyone also, I, as I said in the show, uh, if anyone is a therapist who's listening to the show and wants to help uh, give Judy free therapy, uh, please do get a hold of me. And now, without further ado, here is my episode with Judy. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone. With me today, I have Judy. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. And today we are going to hear the story of your 15-year relationship. And yours is an interesting story because for a bulk of your relationship, you had a what quote unquote normal relationship. And then one day that all ended. And that's when your nightmare began. And today you're going to let it all hang out there for us to hear. And we're going to thanking you right now for being here and sharing your story. I know what you went through is terrible, but you're here. And, uh, you know, now without further ado, Judy, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Brandon. Um, I do want to correct one thing that you said. You had said that for, for 15 years I had um, uh, a normal relationship. I wouldn't call it that. I would actually say it was to me and from everyone who knew me and my life, our life, it was way beyond normal. It was exceptionally wonderful. It was a fairy tale. It was, it was, I, I hate to say perfect, but it was perfect as how I considered it. It was, um, it was, it was wonderful. It was love bomb, I guess, is what you can say in that sense for almost the entirety of it, except for the very end. Um, so I didn't have any warning whatsoever. But um, in retrospect, in hearing other things of things that had happened before, I, I, I know this to be a fact, that that's all it was, that it was never real. Um, he was just really, really good for that long. But I guess I will start a little bit from, to give you a little bit of a background of me and who I am. I come from a very big family, um, one of seven children and uh, a Catholic upbringing. We were um, definitely caretakers for sure. I mean, I guess in, in large families, you can go one way or the other. You can either have, you know, you're scrappy and you're trying to every man for themselves or the way we were raised was to be very selfless, never to, we always just put ourselves last. Um, that was the only way the family could, you know, for that, for the family to survive in that sense. We were always looking out for each other and trying not to be a burden, trying not to be a problem. I know my parents were overwhelmed with so many kids. In fact, I, um, I was number six out of seven. I was born blind in one eye. My left eye is blind. I was very shy growing up. Um, didn't, I felt like I didn't fit in, in some ways and, um, in high school, I, I never went to the prom. I, uh, I was just a shy, shy girl. Um, and I, I never dated and I married my first husband. I met it was the first man I, I, I dated. Um, I was 19, fell in love. Um, I was kind of raised again in this big Catholic family where, um, that was our job. Get married, have kids. And, um, and I did. I got married at 20. I had, um, my son at 21. I had, I was still born at 22. I had my daughter at 23. I had a miscarriage at 24. And I had my other daughter at 25. Um, that was the way 
I was raised. It was crazy. And I was married. We were married for 20 years. He and I, my first husband, this was my first husband, and he didn't want me to work. Um, again, it was very traditional, wanted me to stay home and raise the children. And that's what I did. And I also, I started doing other things, you know, in the community. And I started doing theater and, um, and I loved that. And I ended up then I was doing commercials. I was, um, acting and really starting to feel confident about myself. And I grew up, I, I, I always just feel like as if I grew up and he never did. Um, I believe he cheated on me as well. I have, there were times when he didn't come home at night. Um, we didn't have a tumultuous relationship, but he was just, he just never grew up and he would come and go. And when the kids got older, he, um, he was not of any help at all. Um, when I was going through difficult times with his kids, my son was ha acting up and he just would take off my husband. And so eventually we divorced. I, I did feel alone with the kids. and um, So before we get into meeting this man, uh -huh. so at this point, you have been in a very long-term marriage. You have three children, and you grew up in a family where everyone kind of felt that they were a burden. So everyone's always doing something for someone else. And I guess it's a little bit of self-sacrifice and just the, the thought process of I'm a burden might be always in someone's head within your family unit. So you don't want to go uh, put someone out and also you are might go that extra mile for someone else just so you can have worth or... or um, just not feel like you are in the way. Right. Or being selfish yeah, or okay. pulling attention. Yeah, exactly. And then, exactly. Throw, then throwing on top of everything, you are feeling lonely. Right. You have a lower self-confidence, but that is gaining a little. Mm -hmm. And do you have any other, like, I guess, belief systems as far as, you know, what relationships are, uh, et cetera? Well, yes. Um, uh, you know, ex again, as being raised Catholic, um, that was it. Um, divorce was shameful. I felt like a failure. I felt um, I did have one other sister who was divorced, uh, my older sister. And um, it was kind of, uh, uh, you know, ugly. you know, it was looked down on. Um uh, as a more of a failure rather than, you know, she had gone through this, the poor thing had gone through this horrible relationship. It was more of the marriage failed um, as a negative thing. Um, and that's how I felt too. So as far as your identity goes at this time and your self-worth goes, did you gain a lot of it from being a good mom? I did. I did. Absolutely. I did from being a good mom. And then, um, and then when I was doing theater, I was doing, you know, I did a few commercials and I, I was really appreciated. Um, I took a lot of courage for me to do it, but I, 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 you know, being shy is about wanting to be bold and I just wanted to. And, and I got through it and, and it gave me a lot of confidence and, um, I guess maybe that also gave me the confidence to just to finally say, um, you know, I, I was going to stand on my feet. I didn't, I didn't, I felt as if my, my husband wasn't coming home, uh, whether he, I, I'm fairly certain he, he had someone on the side, um, off and on, um, and, um, was not parenting with me at all. Um, in fact, it, he was trying, he was very permissive and letting the kids get away with stuff and it was making it really hard. Um, and, um, we just didn't have anything in common and any longer. And like I said, I, I feel as if I grew up and he didn't, you know, of course, you know, you can't say you change people. We're supposed to change. We're supposed to grow. And, um, so, and I, so, in, so from transitioning from husband number one to whatever you're looking for next in your relationship, you're looking for someone who's mature has their stuff together and mm -hmm. is going to join you on that journey of growth of where you are and where you want to go uh, in your in your future. 
Exactly. Okay. Exactly. As that's ab- absolutely. But actually, although I wasn't looking for any of that, um, this was back in like, oh gosh, late, like maybe 1999, 2000. I, I was, um, and so I, I was a single mom. I, at that point then started working. I got, um, I had a temp job in the hospital and then I started working as a med tech. I also have ADHD. I don't sit still well, right? So I, I loved the, um, the job working in an emergency room. Just the, I just felt like I was being able to do something positive. I was on my feet. It kept, you know, it just, and I started going to nursing school. Um, and I had the kids. I had the three kids. Um, my, my first husband virtually disappeared from their lives at that point. And I was struggling with, with just just being a mom and and putting my life together, um, and it was fairly quick actually. Um, actually, maybe even while we were working on the divorce, and even before when we were separated, but we were living under the same roof for just a few months. Um, I was online on the internet, and I would play these games in this trivia, like a trivia game, sort of. And there were names you would see again and again. And this was one name. And this person um, started sending me messages. And we would, because we had a lot in common, and we would just talk, and it became one thing led to another. And we started talking quite often. And this was my second husband. Um, uh, He would, he told me he was going through the same thing, um, that he was going through a divorce, and it was awful. But his his was awful that his first wife, his wife was a, this monster and, um, and she was crazy and he wanted to support me. So we kind of, I kind of felt like I could support him. We could support each other. And, um, I, I had gone through the divorce or uh, was still going through divorce. I had moved out. Um, and one day out of the blue, um, I get a message from him. I, you know, we lived in different States at that point we lived, gosh, six, 700 miles away from each other in different states. I'd never been to his state. Um, and I get a message from him saying that he was nearby and he was on a fishing trip. Um, he wanted to go fishing. It was weird that far, but he said he lived in an inland state and wanted to go fishing. And would I meet him for lunch? And I was, said, no, you know, I, 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 no, I it was crossing the line. I didn't, I didn't want a relationship. I was not going to be in one. But then again, he was just so supportive and kind and wonderful. And I, I agreed. I figured, okay, lunch is safe. And, um, and I went and I met him and it was unbelievable. He was everything. Um, he just swept me off my feet. He was kind and charming and, big and strong and wonderful and just so uh, grown up, you know, he had his life together. He had, uh, he had told me he was um, at one point, he was going to go into the ministry. And then he, he, he did decide that he decided he wanted to be a teacher. He loved children and he got his degree teaching and he taught for a couple of years. And then he realized he could make more money in, in this other industry, a, a blue collar industry, where he, he ended up working, uh, made decent money, and then ended up working for a union, um, where he was, he had a very high prestigious job within the union, and he was about to be transferred to another state. Um, and, um, and his, his wife, who he's divorcing anyway, um, as I said, how do you feel about that with your children? Well, um, he had told me by then that he was um, a victim of parental alienation syndrome, that his his first wife was just this horrible, mean, physically abusive, emotionally, mentally abusive in every way, This who refused to work, refused to do anything, was demanding, mean, cruel. She was a hot-headed Italian, he said she was, and she would hit the kids, and they, he stayed together long enough. His one daughter graduated high school, the other one was 14. And, um, same age as my youngest and, but was about to graduate, but they, he couldn't see them anyway. And so, um, it was okay for him to leave. Um, he felt, um, the, he stayed as long as he could and they they were, they were getting divorced. Anyway, he, from that point on, he came 
to see me every weekend. I I worked in in a hospital, like I said, and um, part of it was you know it was always twelve hour shifts, but our job was every other weekend we had to work Saturday and Sunday, so it was eight to eight on Saturday, eight to eight on Sunday. But he came every weekend, regardless of whether I was working or not. So even if I was working, I would be you know eight to eight, and then get up Sunday eight to eight. But he, I would have my lunch break, my dinner break, and I would come home at night and he would be sure to be there with me. He would be sure he wanted to be there for my children. He knew their father had disappeared and he embraced my children. He loved on my children. He showered us in gifts, in trips, in, um, he was just, and he, and our hearts bled for this poor man because he would tell us how he missed his family and his children and, and how important family was and how could my, ex, you know, not be around for these wonderful children. And he, he helped, you know, my son who was going through difficult times and, you know, as a teenager and he just, he was wonderful with him. He taught my daughter how to drive. He would, he took us to Disney world. He came every single weekend for two or three years. And, and it was a nine hour drive. He would come on Saturday, on Friday night after work and he would leave. He was allowed to go in late on Monday. So he would leave early Monday um, drive and then go straight to work. And he would spend the entire weekend with us. Um, I was in heaven. And when he wasn't with me, he was on the phone with me at night. He would call me and we would just have our phones on, on our pillow. And he said, so he can hear me breathing. And he, it was love. It was just, God brought us together for a reason. It was this overwhelming love. And, um, everyone just, was in awe of, and my, my family loved him. They adored him. He was a grown up. He was a, you know, he was a Christian man. He was responsible. He was present for the children. He was there for me. He was very, um, protective and, um, and loving and kind. And I was just so swept off my feet. And after um, the three years, you know, he had he had proposed to me, of course, in a big grandiose way. Oh, what he would do too uh, was interesting. Was he started very? He talked marriage very quickly. It was probably within. It might even have been that first day I met him. He would say to me that I was his future. You're my future. You're my future. I and mean, how perfect this was. And don't you feel it? You know, can't you see? This is just. This is meant to be. And um, started talking marriage right away. Um, and I remember it coming in a text once. It was this really cheesy. And I remember thinking, please don't let that be his marriage proposal to me. It was something, of, you know, and I'll, I'll never forget because now in retrospect, I, I'll, I'll tell you later on. But it was something about, will you be my lady? My something like just cheesy Hallmark stuff. And um if I, and I remember it ended, if I be so bold, one day my wife, and I was like, seriously, you, you know, you real. <laughs> it just sounded just so hokey and ridiculous to me. But, um, and then he, you know, he changes tune back to being, you know, um, just down to earth and, um, wonderful. And he showed up one day, like the movie Love Actually, which I loved that movie with these signs. It was in the rain and I had worked a double shift. And this one time I actually thought he couldn't come to visit and there was a knock on the door and I opened the door and he had this music blasting and he was holding up the signs and he would drop one side and the next, you know, um, will you be with me forever? I love you so much. Please make me the happiest man in the world. Please be, you know, be my wife. And I just melted. The kids loved him. Um, and yeah, I agreed. And, um, so when my daughter was about to enter her junior year in high school, he was transferred his job and he asked if I would meet him in this other state and um and I said no and he said he asked my daughter he said you know what do you think would you want to um and she said sure she loved him and she my other two were older now at that point um they had um they had moved out they were on their own one was going to school the other my son was working and um the youngest and she said you know what I'm up for an adventure and she loved him so much and she said that, this would be so much fun sure let's let's you know, you don't have to wait till I graduate. Let's go. And so we did. So we were, it was three months of him love bombing me, driving every weekend to, uh, to where I lived to then we met in this, we moved to this other state where, um, where we lived together. We got, we got married right away. So, so I just want to 
I guess, chime in here for everyone who's listening who might be saying to themselves, well, this might not, this doesn't sound like what happened to me or, or this, that, or the other along those lines. But what you are dealing with here, this person, you know, their pathology is about power and prestige. And they have this persona that they want everyone to see. And part of that is this family. And part of the equation is you and who you are and what you represent. And that isn't going to be uh, demeaned. That's not going to be devalued in any way. You're not going to have that treatment like other people have because in his mind, he needs you to present this to the world. And that is uh, part of you know what's kind of going on here. You're being used in a way where, you know, maybe this is what happened with his first wife. You know, I'm going to look for something better that's coming along the pipeline. You're a placeholder in life for him. That's kind of how you're being uh, seen through his eyes. And, you know, right now you're the new, you're the, you're the shiny thing. Right. And, and what he made a big deal. And it's interesting you say that because yes, as, as I had said earlier, I, I had done some theater and some commercials and he really played off of that. That was a small part of me to me. I was a mom. I was, I was me. I was Judy. I was, but to him, that was big. He would introduce me as this big actor, this, and I would play it as, I mean, because it wasn't, I did a few commercials. Um, I, I did some regional theater, um, but, um, but that I was arm candy for him. I was, he loved to show me off in that aspect of some side. And in, in, you know, and in the fact that I, I, I was someone who people pleased. So I guess, part of what he wanted to put out there as himself or his ego was that he was this perfect man and we had this perfect um, life. We had this perfect family. We had this, you know, he was a good man. He was a Christian man. And, um, and I was really, then I was a good person and um, would do everything. You know, I always sacrificed myself. So I was always volunteering and, um, um, and, and those are things he can brag about. Right. Absolutely. That's what he, I was his, his, I was what he bragged about. And, um, but I believed it because he loved me and, and we, we continued. So sorry for interrupting you here. I just want to point out that even though throughout the 15 years of your relationship, that you saw no red flags and it is possible that in this relationship or in other similar ones that things might be happening behind the scenes that you don't know about. And I'm not saying that that's what happened here, but as long as there are no questions asked and there's no reason to ask those questions, I guess the mask of your ex and others like them are not going to slip until they get caught. So they love bomb. And his love bombing here is just all love bombing. It was all love bombing. There was no clues of any. There was never. We, I don't think we ever fought. I really don't. If I look back, we might have had a couple of disagreements, very mild. But we always, um, we, we never fought. He was just so kind. And, and in return, I was kind. We just were, it was just, how do you treat somebody who's just so kind in, in a negative way. I mean, I just respected him. I loved him. And that was, this was the life we had. Uh, you know what? I do want to just backtrack a little bit about his family, because I think that's really important. I think that's got, it's something important that I think that the listeners need to pay attention to is the family dynamics of who you're, of the person that you're choosing, you know? And, and of course we can say if they, you know, anybody can come from a bad situation, have these crazy, a crazy family. And, 
that doesn't necessarily mean, well, I'm not going to be with that person because their family is nuts. You know, that, that person, if they show the emotional intelligence to understand and get out of it, but um, there were some red flags with his family. Um, when I initially met them, they were all over me. Oh my gosh, Judy, this is, he had two sisters and his parents. And I, again, same thing. They bragged on me. They told him, oh, he's with this wonderful woman who's this actor. And, and I calm that down, you know, no, I'm just, and, but they, they just adored me. Um, right off the bat, they love bomb me too. And they would go on and on and on about his first wife, about how cruel she was and wouldn't let them see and how he, they never, his first wife never let him, now they all lived in the same town, never let him see them, his family. They couldn't spend holidays together. She would not let him have anything at all to do with his family. She didn't work. She was, she was mean. She was cruel. She was evil. And she wouldn't let him see his family. And um, they were so happy to have me now in his life. And so we moved to this other state and, and we got married. We actually got married. We decided to do a small wedding um, with just he and I and the kids. He decided he didn't want to have his family because he said it was just because it's just you and me and the kids. Those because then if we have my parents and my sisters, we'll have your parents and your sisters. Let's just do you and me and the kids, and then we'll have a big party um, after. And we had this huge wedding party you know, two weeks later at the house. Um, I decorated and 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 cooked and we catered and. It was just lovely, but oddly, his family came in, and it was a football game and was on, and they took everything away from the living room where I had it all set up with flowers, and they they brought in speakers, and they watched the football game. Um, it was, it was kind of weird, um, and he was, he told, I, I was not happy with it, and he told me he wasn't either, but, um, but we ended up going outside. Most of the party was outside, and, and. Anyway, so he then said to me, I always loved horses. And he knew that I was a big animal lover. He said, so did he. Oh, in fact, he used to um, ride horses. He said when he was growing up, he worked on a dairy farm. And I should have realized that later. Um, you don't herd dairy cattle, <laughs> you know, but he told me he did. And, um, and he said, and he wanted to be everything to me. And he knew I loved horses. He said, we're going to build this house, this beautiful log home. And I said, are you kidding? This was a dream, Brandon. This was, and he did. He built this, abs and, and convinced me at that point, uh, I'll backpedal. When we got married, um, I had excellent credit. I had a 401k um, that I had built up. Actually, it was even from my first marriage. Um, I had part of that because he didn't want me to work, my first husband. Um, and I had some money saved and, um, and I had credit. He had really bad credit. He had nothing. Um, and he said it was his, his wife had destroyed everything and, um, had run up the credit cards and she destroyed everything. So we used, um, my credit, my down payment for the, for the house, the land. And he had a really good job. And that was, you know, that, that was taken into account and we got a loan. For this beautiful home, um, we built a farm, uh, a gorgeous log home with the cathedral ceiling and the beautiful glass. And, and we ended up, we got these horses and um, that I loved. They were wonderful. They were beautiful. And that was my dream. And then um, chickens and dogs and cats and the children. And then eventually my children had children. We had grandchildren. And from the, he was there when they were all born. Um, they called him Papa, and we had this incredible, amazing, beautiful life where he went, he went on um, social media. Um, he went on, uh, was it MySpace? Um, I was never part of that. And then he, he went on Facebook, and um, eventually I went on Facebook. Um, and he, he would go on and put pictures of the home and the children and the animals and the horses and in such an incredible light. And he would write these things. He would, everything I love about Judy. Um, and he would just, and people would swoon over it. Oh my gosh, Judy, you are so blessed. Your life is so wonderful. And I believed it. And I would do the same with him then. Oh, how much I loved our life and our home. Um, eventually, so then, um, this is important. So then he, 
at one point we were married just a little bit and I ended up, um, as I said, I had was blind in one eye. I ended up having issues with my other eye. Um, I would lose the center of my vision and I went to the eye doctor and we realized I had um, a TIA, a mini stroke. Workup revealed I also have these congenital heart defects, which is kind of weird because I'm very healthy and very active. Um, but this is all kind of tied in my eye and my heart. And um, I had have open heart surgery and um, I, I did. And he was with me throughout and just telling the world, please, you know, Judy is my world. Please, everybody pray. And this was, and, and I, I was fine, you know, I was fine. And, um, and then we go back into our life and this wonderful life. And then about 10 years into the relationship, again, it's just, it's a fairy tale and he gets very sick. He, he gets, he has the flu and he goes into respiratory distress. He's in the hospital and, um, He's there for two months in the ICU, and they don't think he's going to make it. Throughout the time, um, I do think it's important with his family. Um, his family started fading from our life, and I just thought it was odd because they kept saying to him, why don't you have your family for the holidays and wanted to invite them? They were out of state, as was mine, except for the children who moved by us. And um, But he would say, no, you know, there's there's drama, always drama with them or whatever. And I had said, but, you know, but you love them. And he would always talk about how much he loved them. Um, and I would always kind of in the back of my mind worried about how he and his family had said how he, how the first wife kept him from them. I didn't want to be that first wife. And I encouraged the family relationship, but um, he really just couldn't be bothered with him. He was too in love with me, he would say. I just love our life. They're just drama, and I love our life. So he got sick. So for two months, he's in the ICU, and his family would would ask how things were going, and you know, I would keep them up to date. And then the one sister said, can I just drop mom at the house? To, to She wants to feel like she's helping. Now, at that point, um, he was um, he was not intubated. He was he was um, and and we knew that. I had a friend who was a pulmonologist, as did he, with a mutual friend. I had been, as I said, a med tech. I knew a little bit about medicine, and the whole point was to try to keep him off the ventilator, because we knew if he got on the ventilator, he could get dependent and never come off um, because of his how bad his lungs were from this respiratory distress that he went into from the flu, how it just attacked his lungs, um, and so. His his family, I would keep them up and I would say to them, no, I, I need to be at the hospital because I knew his oh, and his father had passed away um, a, a couple of years before. And that was odd, too, because they talked about how much they loved him. But as he was dying, they were all up at Cracker Barrel and my daughter and I were at his bedside. And it didn't make sense, but yet they were always this loving, loving family. And I always just say to him, in retrospect, it's funny, I don't understand the language of your people, which is basically, with, uh, their words never match their actions. They talked about love, talked about love, but they never really showed it in so many in, in ways. They were very demonstrative publicly. And that was what I started seeing kind of with my husband. He would tell the world how much he loved me, but privately... He didn't really say so much to me like that. We had a wonderful life, don't get me wrong. But I would ask him, what is it that you love about me? What, and he, he would, oh, oh, you know, Judy, you, you know, you know. And, um, and I just thought it was kind of odd that he, he would make a big deal in public. But um, privately, he, he stopped. But, but, um, but I was just blissfully in love, blissfully happy. Um, I just like to point out here that that's a very good awareness that you had to ask that question at that time, especially when nothing was going on to really probe in that way and nothing extreme and that you were able to also see that, you know, actions here or at least words aren't matching actions as far as the family is going and, you know, it just not too many people would kind of uh, step in and, and ask that question. And it's a, it's a really good question to ask, which is like, what do you love about me? And, you know, obviously you won't think much of, you know, maybe that question after the fact because everything else is kind of uh going on that's just you know continuously good so there's nothing really to 
get upset about. But at the same time, you know, something in you had you asked that question. Right, exactly. Um, because it was it was very demonstrative. It was it's something about it was starting to feel a little superficial. He would shower me in gifts. I he ended up buying me a camera, and I I loved photography, loved animals, and started taking pictures and started building a photography business. And that was our life plan: was that I was going to um, start this little business and start doing portraits and weddings. And when he retired. Um, he would assist me and that would supplement our retirement because he had a really good pension and that was going to be it. He did not want me to work. He begged me not to work. I, as I said, my, oh, because I do have to say that. I have to go back. I was in nursing school when I was living as a single mom and I was working as a med tech. But when he asked me to move with him out of state, he asked me to drop that because first of all, my, my licensing for the med tech wouldn't transfer out of state. Um, my schooling, I would have to start all over because the curriculum was different from one state to another. And he said, why would you do that? You know, I'm going to retire in about 10 years. We have, I, he travels a lot for work. He wanted me to travel with him. He said, listen, I waited. He was married 25 years. He said, I waited my whole life for this. I never knew love. I finally know this is the kind of love that comes once in a lifetime. And I finally know what love is. And I want to spend every minute with you. And, and then as it happened, then he, right away, he built this house. He got the horses. He needed me to take care of the farm to, so I was training the horses. I was working with the horses. I was, you know, learning horses, but doing it at the same time. Um, I, I love gardening. I created those beautiful gardens and he would show them off. I did, um, again, as I said, I have ADD. I don't sit still. I, I built a pizza oven out of, a cob oven out of clay that I did up, dug up out of the woods and, 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 and repurposed brick. And it was, just, and it was beautiful. My granddaughter came, we ended up putting mosaics around it. When my son got married, we had the rehearsal dinner at the house. I built, um, I used cedar from the trees that fell down. Very resourceful. I would just use things that I would find and ended up now I, I do art with this, but back then I was starting and I, and so when my son got married, we had the rehearsal dinner. We did 40 pizzas, you know, in that oven. It was brick oven pizza. And, and it was, he would show that off to everybody in the gardens and the grapevines and the trees that I planted and the flowers and the animals. Um, I built a lot of structures at the property. And as I was building my photography business, that's what I would use it for. I use, utilized it for a lot of it for women um, who didn't have self-esteem because I knew that was me. Um, and that's why I was drawn to the theater. And I found it started with a little girl who just didn't feel she was pretty enough to take pictures. And it broke my heart. And I had a, a, a session scheduled with her. And um, and I talked to her her mom and I said, you know, what are we going to do? What We've got to do this because she's gorgeous. What What's going to make her feel beautiful? And she said, I'll call you back. And she called me and she laughing and she said she wants to be a mermaid. I said, well, then she's going to be a mermaid. And I got stuff together and I made this, we made, we made this mermaid costume and I found this old trunk and we went to the river and I, and it was, she felt so beautiful. And it kind of took off from there where I was doing photos for women, particularly, um, using, I would save costumes and I used the horses and the chickens and the pasture and the barns and the gardens. And it was these beautiful fairy tale, um, photos. Um, and, um, this was my business and it was my joy. Um, I was starting it out. I wasn't making a lot of money. I was doing a lot for friends and volunteer, volunteer work. Um, in those pictures, mostly for women who needed that boost. And, um, he would brag about it. And I was getting a lot of, um, positive feedback. And I think that that's when he started, um, feeling a little less, his ego needed a little more, I think. But but I'm going to backtrack for him being sick, though. I'm sorry, I, I jumped around a bit. Oh, before you what? before you backtrack to to being sick, I just want to say one thing: you're a really good person. Well, thank you, thank you. I try to be. You know, I feel as if that's what was. You know, I guess being raised the way I was, we had to to be good. You know, that's just what I always wanted to do was just to be right and do the right thing, whether it was my self-esteem or whatever. Um, but, um, that was exploited. Um, you'll, you'll hear, mm. you'll hear. Um, all right. So he was sick. I'm going to go back. He was sick. And I had, you know, messaged his, would tell his family 
and they didn't come. Um, and then, um, and one day the sister said, I'm going to drop mom. And I said, listen, she hated the animals, hated horses, hated the dogs. I said, I can't, you can't leave her at the house. I can't, they only allow one person in the ICU. And because we're tr- fighting hard to keep him off the ventilator, um, the doctors in the hospital and the nurses, they, we gained trust in each other. They knew that I had um, some medical knowledge that I worked in an emergency room. They knew I knew how to work the leads and the, you know, and so I would disconnect him and give him his bed baths and toilet him. And he didn't want his mother doing that. And they trusted that I, I would do it because in order for them to do it, they would basically have to put him on a ventilator. And they knew that they knew too. We all knew that that would, that would probably kill him um, too, because he would become dependent because his lungs were that bad. Um, so his family, um, started posting on Facebook that I wouldn't let him know what was happening. They weren't coming. And I said, yes, please come, but bring mom for a visit. Let her stay at the, at the, at the niece's house who lived a couple towns away and let her bring him. But I can't, I can't host her. You know, I can't drive her around. I can't, you know, as much as I, I understand she wants to feel like she's helping out. I, I, um, I, I, I have to, I'm worried about him dying. You know, his life is on the line. Um, and all of a sudden, one day, my, my parents actually came through town. They were on their way on vacation and they stopped at the hospital to see him. And, um, so when his sister called one day, the next day, I had mentioned, well, well, that can't be. Now, how, it looks, how terrible would that look if we don't come and your parents came? And I said, well, then come and see him. But, wait a couple of days because they're going to transport him north to there's a, a lung transplant hospital um and they need to keep him quiet for a couple of days to make sure that he can manage in the ambulance without the ventilator um we have to prove that he can stay on this non-rebreather for two hours for the ambulance drive but they didn't take no for an answer they said oh no but your family was there and it would look terrible if your family was there and we weren't there so we have to come we're coming today and um and i begged them please the 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 nurses i was outside in the hallway crying arguing with them the nurses said tell them i'll call security if they try to come to the hospital wait till he's transported and um this was a big turning point in our relationship the way his his family with his family and I guess even with him in a way, he was angry with his family. Um, and they started saying things publicly on, on social media, how I would, I refuse to allow him, them to see him. And I, I wouldn't give them updates. Now I have, I still have my phone from back then text messages of me telling them, listen, I need to know that you have this message. This is what's going on. He's going to this. He's doing that. Please tell, and, you know, his mother at one point just said, got text. Um, she was very, they were, again, they were saying that I was the first wife all over again, won't let him see the, the, their son. And um, I even, again, and I, once he was transported, I said, well, when are you coming to see him? Um, and they didn't. They said, well, you said we couldn't. I said, no, I didn't. I said, those two, the, the, actually, it was the one day when they were preparing him for transport and he had to stay calm. The hospital staff asked, but then once he's here, of course, you know, it, it would be good for him to see. Um, but they didn't come and they blamed me. They kept saying it was my fault. Um, so he was there for two months, but he would post I on social media after a few weeks, after about a month and a half, he would, he, jumped in and he would say how he would tell everybody how he um, was so grateful and that to please pray for him because he had, he didn't want to leave me that I was his angel that he had, um, I was, I had saved his life. I got him to the hospital. I had not left his bedside. Um, I've been there day and night and we have a lifetime of dances to dance. We have, it was this love story of the century, right? And, and I truly felt like, um, I started buying into it that God put us together. You know, I went through this with my heart. Now here he's going through this with his lungs and, and, and we were going to save him and the whole world, every, the town, the community, his industry, all were rallying around. What can we do to help? What can we do to help? And finally, he was going to be, um, 
he was ready to be discharged. They had him on a lung transplant list. They thought that he was going to need um, a lung transplant. Now, at one point in between, I was doing medical transcription for um, Brigham and Women's in Boston, and I would do things like lung transplants. And I do know that um, a lung transplant is very, very difficult. You'll maybe get four or five years but the quality of life is terrible, and you very rarely, very rarely did patients, at least back then, I don't know now, would make it with a lung transplant. And and the whole plan was if we can get him on room air or just minimal ox- oxygen, he'd be way better off than with a lung transplant. So it was just trying to give his lungs time to heal. And the lungs are different from the heart. Like with mine, the lungs, the lungs can take a lot longer to heal. So I... My friend, our friend who was a pulmonologist said, listen, if, if he had any chance to get better, to heal, it's at home with you and the children and the horses and, um, that he loves where he loves. And he'll, he'll, if you, if they put him in the, in, in, um, in rehab, like, um, we, like they wanted you to wait for a transplant. Um, it's an institution. People start feeling sick and he'll never get better. So I brought him home. And, um, of course, you know, this was the love of my life and he would cry. He would hold my hand and say, Judy, why, why am I going to die? Please don't let me die. Please don't let me die. And I said, you're not dying. You're not, you know, and and then he would say, you know, you never signed up for this. Um, I'm afraid you're going to leave me. And I said, what, Uh, what do you mean? I love you so much. I I'm fighting for your life. Um, whatever it takes, if we have to sell the house, let's sell the house. I will, I'll work. I can, I'll get my photography going. I'll go back to nurse, whatever it takes, but I'm not going to let you die. I'm never going to leave you. We're in this forever. I love you. We're, we're, you know, everything he said we were, God brought us together. And, uh, and so I spent a year, you know, it was a year dressing him, bathing him, feeding him, taking him to the toilet. And I eventually, um, when he was able to take a couple of steps, I, I got his horse. Um, I worked with her to um, not be afraid of the liquid oxygen. Liquid oxygen is icy cold and it hisses, right? This was an off-track thoroughbred. And I would get her used to where I could take the oxygen and put one on one side of the saddle, one on the other, and get a regular metal green tank and put it on the back. And to, when he was able to take a few steps and I could get him on a mounting block, I got him on his horse and we would <clears throat> ride around the neighborhood and people would just, um, just be just so moved by the love and devotion. And he would tell everybody, this is, you know, Judy is my angel. She saved me the horse, the home. This was, you know, meant to be and how much, you know, what, a, and so the love bombing grew even more um, from that. It was how he would just tell the world and he would shower me in gifts and vacations. And I'd say, you know, we can't afford this. No, but we live once. We can't take it with us. And he would, he, he did everything for me. And um, it was a wonderful life it, that just kept getting better and better. Anyway, so fast forward um, to 2015, and I um, I start having some issues with my heart, okay? My heart is getting a little, I was getting these arrhythmias. Uh, it, whether it was from the open heart surgery, from scar tissue, we don't know, and still to this point don't know, but I was having some issues with my heart, and uh, this is 2014, I'm sorry, and the doctor wanted to implant this cardiac monitor, okay, this monitor that would go in and it would communicate with this um, a device to the doctor every night. Every night it, it would hold a day's worth of EKGs. And then it would, at night, it would communicate, it, the, the device in my chest would communicate to this bedside um, thing, device, which would then transmit everything to the doctor. Um, and they asked me when I had the monitor put in, do you have cell phone service at your house? They said, yes, I do. How many bars? Four. Oh, great. Okay, so... They put it in. Well, they made a mistake. This so this this company. Um, there are two different cell phone towers here in the states. There's there's uh, I forget CDM and or GSM and CD some whatever the acronyms are. But one is basically like AT and T, and the other is Verizon, the two main servers. That's why some people can say I have AT and T and I don't get service, and someone could get it, get Verizon and have service at a house. Well, that's the way it was. You could get service at my house with Verizon, but not AT&T. But this device needed the, the AT&T tower. 
So um, it wasn't working. So they had to take it out. So it was a surgery. It wasn't a major surgery, more like a... um, like a, uh, a pacemaker. Um, but because of other issues with my health, I had to limit the anesthesia and, um, it was very painful. Um, and I was angry at this, 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 um, this pharmaceutical company. And I put a rant on their Facebook page of basically saying, you need to check patients to make sure before you have allowed this device to be installed, you know, you know, the limitations of it because I didn't want to see Mostly elderly would be people who would need this device. And I didn't want to see them being taken advantage of and having to go through surgery. And so I posted this and um, my husband posted it as well. He cross posted it and said, you know, this is every, you know, getting everybody up in arms about it. Excuse me. A couple of days later, he says, look, this, some, he had some friends comment on it. And there was one name he pointed out. He said, this is an attorney. Um, I think she's an attorney. She, I know her from the industry. And um, I, uh, she, she said, let me know if I can be any help. And I said, well, where is she? And he told me, I said, no, she's not even in this state. Um, and I don't, I don't want to do a lawsuit. I just want them to, you know, just the power of public opinion, just let people know. And then he said, okay. And, and that was that. And, um, so we continued, and I continued having issues with my heart. It was starting to get a little worse, and um, and he started having to work a little more. And he would go away, and he would come back and make it up to me tenfold. I'm so sorry. I, uh, you know, I've been having to work and take me on vacation and say let's go, let's go to the mountains, and that's what we would do, and back and forth. And then he had a um, a um, a convention in Vegas that summer. While we were there, he had said to me, you know, that that attorney, she has been pursuing me. She keeps asking. She really wants to take your case about this monitor. And I said, I dropped that a long time ago. You know, it's it's a not, but, you know, it's really important for, and he pl- played on my, on my emotions, you know. Again, like you always said, you don't want this to happen to other people. And, you know, the only way to do that is, you know, if you see them and, you know, this, she really wants to take your case. And I said, you know, she said, just send her a synopsis of the situation. And I did. I finally said, okay, I'll do that. All right. And so I sent her all of my personal information about my health and the background and what happened. And um, she said, you know, I really want to do this and we're going to go for this. And this is, you know, this is awful what they did to you. And um, so she and I, so she, she took me as her, my, as a client. Um, she said, even though I was out of state, she was going to get an attorney in my state that would, um, that she could work with who, so that we could file it there. And they were just kind of, I don't remember how, how she worded it, but I, I was kind of halfway in and out of even wanting to do it, but I had agreed because I thought it was for the greater good. Right. So, um, she got a lot of personal stuff out of me. She was grilling me. And, um, and then finally, at one point she said, I, you know, I thanked her and I said, you know, what can I do, um, you know, pay you? And she said, no, this is a contingency. She said, but, you know, your husband told me you're a photographer. Um, I would like some pictures from my website. And I said, okay, you know, sure. What what would you like? And she said, uh, working class people, um, um, a a nurse, a medic, a teacher, and and a handsome blue collar worker type looking like your husband. And, and, And I was a little taken back by that. And I said, you know, who is this woman? I never threatened because I knew my husband loved me so much, but I, I, I said, well, let me look her up. And I, I looked her up on, you know, my, my, my woman got, you know, got my woman up on, and I, I looked her up on, on Facebook and there she was, you know, with this, I mean, she's obviously, you know, in her fifties, but she had this bleach blonde hair and she was posing like a teenager, you know, with the lips out and the, and the whole photo was just, you know, just looked really tacky and just we try and I was like, oh, ew, you know, he would never be interested. In that. You know, that's just, just tacky. And, um, and I never thought much of it, but I got her the pictures that she wanted. You know, I actually used my daughter as a nurse. She was a nurse at that point. My son as a medic, my friend, uh, staged as a teacher and I had him in his, in some, um, blue collar, you know, had a hard hat and made it me sure he, I was so in love with him that day, taking these beautiful pictures, taking pictures of him for her. And she thanked me. And, um, 
that was that was in I guess August of 2015, and come uh, the end of October, you know, he he then started having to work a lot, and he was on the road quite a bit, um, and but uh, my health was getting worse, my heart was acting up, and I was getting more and more worried, but I started worrying about him because then there were times when his he wouldn't answer the phone, and that was so out of character for him, and. Um, especially, you know, I was there when he was dying. And I, he said to me how he was so worked, overworked, that his boss was being so hard on him. And he felt so helpless. He was so worried about me. He felt so helpless that he had to, he knew he couldn't do anything. He needed to work and he would turn his phone off. And, um, and, and I believed him because when he came home, he made it up to me tenfold. He would, he would, he would, he started buying me these expensive lenses and, um, let's build another ch- a new chicken group and let's get more chickens and let's, you know, do this with the horses and just, just, and posting about it all over social media, um, about our wonderful, joyful life excessively more and more and more. And, you know, I, I, and then he would, have to go away again. I wouldn't hear from him. And again, I, I started then feeling like I was a bird going back to, you know, when I was little. And so I didn't want to tell him what was going on with my health. Then I tried to take care of it without him knowing, but I was worried because also in, in addition to my heart acting up, um, I started losing my hair in the back of my head. And I've got a big, thick head. Anyway. And I was started losing my hair on the crown. And, and this was all clinical stuff. I mean, um, you know, you could see the arrhythmias. My doctor, you know, you could see the um, the change in my heart and this hair loss. And he started, he was worried about, because I lived on a farm and I had well water. Well, maybe there's there's some kind of heavy metal poisoning. And we had the water tested, the well tested, and he started he tested me for these heavy metals because that's how heavy metal poisoning could, um, could manifest. And um, everything came out negative. But this things continued to slowly get worse, and I tried to um, keep it under my belt because I didn't want to worry my poor husband who was working so hard. And um, at one point, then I get the end of October, I get an email from this woman, this attorney, saying, "You know, I looked into your case, and I decided um, it just won't be financially feasible for me to do it. Um, We would need a class action suit and." And I'm just thinking, and I said to my husband, I said, what's that all about? You know, I never wanted to do this to begin with. She pursued me. Um, she had been monopolizing my days for, for three months, um, just asking me for documents and, and information. And then, she, you know, for her to drop the case for the same reason I told her she wouldn't want the case. You know, it's you can't go after a pharmaceutical company. It's almost impossible. And um, now... And I was a little bothered by it, but I, you know, I dropped it and, um, and that was that. Um, now October then also, that was our anniversary and um, he decided he wanted to go on the honeymoon that we never had. He planned this big elaborate trip to Arizona. As soon as we got back from Arizona, he suddenly had an emergency he had to go to and he left. Um, and then, um, same thing, his phone was off the hook and the same thing he would tell me and I was feeling like, is it me? I'm worried about my health. My health, my heart was getting worse and is, I didn't want to worry him. So, um, we continued this, uh, back and forth. And then Christmas, we had a wonderful Christmas. Um, and he, he showered me in gifts and, um, and presents and, um, but right before, oh, by the way, which is important, I had to have a few days on December 21st, I had to, the doctors decided my heart was getting worse. He wanted, they wanted to do a cardiac ablation where they would try to get these arrhythmias to stop, um, like a laser kind of thing. So I go to the hospital and he takes me and, um, the ablation failed and they decided we're going to have to keep you to put you on this tegus in this dangerous cardiac medication where, I mean, it could save your life. It can get you back into rhythms, but it was also one that you have to, the FDA, you know, insists you have to spend 72 hours under strict hospitalization because it could also do the opposite. It could kill you. And they had to make sure. So I had to stay in the hospital. And, um, so he stayed with me and that night he said, um, um, as things were winding down, after, you know, after the, the, the procedure failed, they decide I'm going to have to stay. And he said, I'm going to go home 
to get the house ready for Christmas for you. I, I never, I've been so busy with work. I have some shopping I need to do. And, you know, normally he never, I never left his side. He said, you know, I, I wouldn't have left your side, but I just, I want everything perfect for you. And, um, and I, I said, okay. And he left. Um, and while he was gone, I had some complications and the, um, they put me on strict bed rest and my heart started getting, going crazy. And I tried to call him to tell him and there was no answer and I didn't understand, you know, and I kept trying and trying and trying. And the next morning, I never heard from him. And the next morning I get a call and he said, Oh, Judy, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I was so exhausted from being overworked. I got home. I fed the horses. I did some shopping. I, I fell asleep. I passed out on the couch. Um, I'm on my way. I'll be, I'll be at the hospital soon for the doctor's rounds. And he got there for the doctor's rounds. And I remember him telling the doctor it was it, the, the, the focus came off of me. It was all about us. It became, we had this most wonderful marriage and this, this wonderful, you know, the great American love story of how, you know, he almost died and I saved him. Now he's here with me and how much, how we had these, these, we both came from bad marriages and how we had this wonderful love story and this fairy tale life and everything was just perfect. And I, again, I was blissfully in love with this man. And I just but was feeling so sad for him because he was really going through a hard time with work of having to be work, having to work a lot. Um, and, um, and that was, that was, and then we had Christmas. And so I was, I was released on Christmas Eve. We had a wonderful Christmas. The kids came, we had matching pajamas, just these silly pictures of all of us together. Uh, so I just want to point out here, uh, I'm going to stop you right here. I just want to point out here for everyone that, you know, you're the one that's not doing well and you're feeling bad about him being overworked. Correct. Right. Right. He knew I was, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, um, but, and, and he would, when he was home, he would make it up to me, but, um, but I was worried about him. So I played it down. So that was Christmas. And then on January 6th, 2015, and I'll never forget that day, 2016, it was the um, worst, one of the worst days of my life. I, I walked in, and I, he had his no, he opened, he had the door locked. He was in my, in one of the, the guest bedroom and the door was locked and, and I knocked and he opened the door and he had his nose in the phone. And I looked, my eyes followed his to his phone and I see, I love you. And he saw that I saw that. And his reaction was like, uh, he gasped and, 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 and Brandon, I don't know why I did this, because this is the man that was just to me, I trusted with, I loved and trusted the most honorable, honest, responsible, kind, wonderful man I ever knew. But I instinctively, for whatever reason, grabbed the phone and ran. And he ran after me and tackled me and um, had me on the ground and had me in a headlock. And he um, ripped the phone from my hands. And I just started crying. I said, well, who is that? Who is it? You know, because it was his reaction made me react, right? Um, and he started screaming. I never heard him scream before. And um, his face was red and he was spitting at me and he was holding me down with one hand while he was deleting this conversation with the other. And um, who is it? Who is it? I'm crying. Who was that? Who was that? No one, no one, you know, why you, why did you even, you know, you're crazy. This is just you because you're crazy. And I'm on the floor crying and he turned and he stopped himself and he ran out the door. Um, and this is January. He sat in his car, um, for an hour. I was on the floor, um, just totally in absolute shock. You know, what happened here? Um, this is the quintessential, I guess, in retrospect, you know, you, you try to educate yourself. This was the mask of the narcissist fly, falling off. And I saw behind the mask. For the first time in 15 years, I'd never seen the monster. Um, and, and it, it got, it, you'll, you'll hear. But, um, so he, um, after about an hour, he comes back in like somebody unidentifiable, someone I'd never seen. And he's bloating. And he, here was this man who showed me nothing but love. I mean, gentle, kind, tr- wonderful for 15 years. Suddenly is this monster. Won't you be embarrassed when you hear who that was? Who was it? It was my sister. It was my sister. Do you see how crazy you are? All this time, you won't let me see my family. And and it's my... And what do you mean I won't let you see your family? You don't want to see your family. And then your, his family couldn't be bothered when he was sick. He was mad at them for that. 
Um, and then they wanted to come with, and, and I was like, I don't understand this. What do you mean? Um, and he says, it was my sister. And he showed me a text from his sister. He said, you know, you had me so upset by the way you reacted like this, like a crazy woman that I had to grab the phone when all along it was my sister. And I got out to the car and I realized, you know, poor Judy, she must have been so afraid of the way, you know, at seeing that. And it's understandable because she's on this medication that probably made her crazy, right? This is what he's telling me. And he said, um, my heart medication, and he said um, that I decided that the right thing to do would be to retrieve the deleted text. And I retrieved the deleted text. And um, I kind of bought that. Because um, I felt crazy. I felt like, you know, when you're with somebody and they're so wonderful for 15 years, suddenly I, I just, I felt like I was going crazy. And I, I didn't think then that you actually can't delete. You cannot recover a deleted text. You know, now in retrospect, I know that. But, um, you know, if, if you text me right now and I, I open it and I delete it, I can't go back and get it. Unless in between, I take my phone and back it up to a computer and then format my phone and then put the backup on. He didn't have a computer out there. He didn't back his phone up. He, he can't recover deleted text, but I didn't realize that. And um, he told me that I was crazy. And I started thinking, like, maybe I was. Um, my heart was getting worse. I was on all these new medications. Um, my, Like I said, my hair started to lose my hair. I was starting to feel like I was going crazy. And he started then treating me like that for a few days. He was still there, but he left the next day. He had to go on business and didn't answer his phone the whole time again, say, because he was now angry at me because of the way I acted. But there were a few days that he was home, you know, because he would tell me he had to go on the road. He had to travel. Um, and then he, when he came home, he was this, this monster escalated to where I remember thinking, um, one day, um, and I, I saved my text messages and I realized that too, when you're being gaslit, I didn't realize I, because I was starting to feel crazy. I started saving text messages and started recording conversations because I didn't know if I was going crazy or, or what was happening. And so I was saving, um, everything. And so in those messages, I, I remember, I can see, I mean, I still have them. Um, you know, I was texting him, you know, um, I'm so afraid of, we had a snowstorm coming. I'm so afraid of being alone in the house with you. I don't know what happened to you. And I would say again and again, who are you and what have you done with my husband? And, um, he, he was, it's not me. It's you. You're crazy. It's the, you know, I have to get away from you. Um, and, um, what do you mean you have to get away from me? I don't, I don't remember any fights. We never fought. What's going on? You know, that thing with the phone, I, you know, if that was the medication or what, but you do understand the way you grabbed and acted, you know, it was, it was, it was minuscule the way I, you know, but he was, he was, he was telling me how crazy I was. And, um, and I told him I was afraid to be in the house with him. And I remember we had the snowstorm, right? The snow came, was coming and, um, and even I look back on the texts and what I, and I'll remember in the house being so afraid of him. I started thinking like it was like that, that Jack Nicholson movie, right? He's pacing floors. He's, he's a monster. He couldn't even look at me without, with disgust and hatred. And I was so confused, right? And, um, at one point, he started screaming at me and I, I was saying, what is going on? Who are you? What happened? What? I was worried about him too. Are you okay? Are you okay? And, um, and we got to the point where he started screaming and I'm on the floor, literally begging for mercy. He takes his phone out. He starts recording me and mocking me and screaming at me. And the more he did, I mean, I guess he was trying to trigger me to fight back so that he could, I don't know, but I was, instead, I just, I was just this, this confused, pathetic bag of bones on the floor, begging for mercy, asking him what, what is going on? What's happening? Who are you? And finally, he grabbed his fist and he pulled it back. And I've never seen such rage and hatred. And he pointed his fist at my skull and he came down closer and closer. And I'm on the floor and I thought for sure he would kill me. If, if he could, that's the hate I saw. I was so frightened. And I got out from under him and I ran in the bathroom. And I closed it and I locked the door. And um, 
He turned off his phone and he started pounding on the floor, on the door, screaming, I dare you to tell anybody, no one will believe you. No one will believe you. And I just didn't know. And I believed that because this man was so wonderful. Everybody loved him. Everybody loved him as I did. Everybody loved our love, our magical, wonderful life. No one, I, here I am now suddenly on this heart medicine and I'm losing my hair. Of course, they're going to think I'm going crazy, right? And um, he, um, he's pounding on the door and I just stayed in the bathroom shaking. Um, the snow had stopped. Eventually, I hear he didn't do any. He was he was not there. And um, as soon as I was convinced he was not right outside the door, I ran out the door, grabbed my my bag, um, my keys, and my boots, and I I jumped in my car and I drove away. Now we had a long driveway, a hundred foot driveway. He parked his car that morning at the end of the driveway, and he never did that. He said in case we get snowed in, he wants to be able to get out. So I knew he wouldn't be able to get to his car to go after me and he couldn't run. So I went down the driveway and I left and I spent that night in the Taco Bell parking lot, right? Just, I didn't want to call anybody because I believed when he said no one would believe me. And um, I thought I was going crazy. I didn't know what was happening and was it me? And um, I, I, I didn't sleep. I was just, I would turn the car on and, um, to warm up and, and, uh, eventually the sun came up, you know, it was seven o'clock in the morning. I felt all kinds of rain, right? It, so everything was scary in the dark, right? And I went home and, um, he was there pacing the floors again. And I was terrified, but I was exhausted. And I told him I was gonna, I was just gonna go to bed. I don't know what's happening and apologizing. Um, I said, I'm gonna go to bed and I went to sleep. And I remember it was about probably 10 or 11 in the morning. Um, he woke me up. I woke up because I hear he's fumbling in the room over by the window. And I asked him, you know, what are you doing? What are you doing? And he said, I'm going to start the generator in case we lose power. I just want to make sure it's running. And I said, well, why, you know, we're not going to lose power. The snow stopped, you know, we, if we lost power, it would have been yesterday, right? You know, it wasn't like a heavy, wet snow. I said, we're not going to lose. And he said, no, I just, just think, and it didn't make sense. But then again, nothing he said was that week made any sense. And so, um, he, he turned, he turned the generator on, um, he left and I just, I couldn't sleep. The noise, the smell, I just, I got up and I got my camera and I went out to the woods and I had the dogs and the horses and I was taking pictures out in the woods. But for three hours, and again, in retrospect, I look at my texts, I was texting him, where are you? I can't turn the generator off. You know, the noise, the smell, let's just turn this generator off. I couldn't find him. And Finally, I said to him, and I remember being outside, and I the the switch was broken on the generator, the on-off switch. And I text him again. I still have the text. I said, "I'm just gonna. The switch is broken. I can't get it off. The smell that it's gonna run out of gas. You know, um, if we're gonna lose power. We're not gonna have any gas. Um, um, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna. Tr- I'm gonna find the key and I'm gonna override it and I'll turn it off with the key. And I went in the house. They said, "I don't have the key. I can't find the key." And after three hours, he said, I'll, I'll do it. And he came down the driveway. He was down the driveway and he had the key and he turned it off. And, um, and I was freezing by then. And I, I'm going in the house to warm up and I went in the house. I went to go back to bed and the bedroom was icy cold. It was freezing. And I, I realized the window was open. I, that's he was over by the window fussing earlier. I said, that's weird. And I just closed the window and I went in, um, and took a bath and, and never thought of that incident again till later. And I'll tell you about that later. But, um, but anyway, so fast forward, um, uh, th- about the next day, he said to me, uh, it was a Friday and he said he had to leave to, for work. He had to go meet with somebody. Um, he had to go testify before in the Capitol and whatever he had to do with his, his work and, uh, had to prepare, but he would be back on Monday and he left. This was a Friday. He took his overnight bag. And that was the last I saw of him outside court. So, um, so you know, I, I, I just want to kind of discuss here, you know, the gravity of everything, which is for 15 years, you saw this one person and then you caught him with you know, what was going on behind the scenes for the first time. The mask slipped. And all of a sudden, your life was a horror film. In in the sense of, you know, it was, 
Yeah, it was so out of the ordinary that it was scare- so scary that, you know, yes, you were afraid of your life, but at the same time, it the behavior was so crazy and out of the ordinary and so, you know, discombobulating in every way that you really thought he had gone crazy. And, you know, and that is is the the really scary part that um, you know you really and and everyone would think this is that like something has gone wrong in his brain, something ha- something has broken, and and I, I, you know I don't know if I'm going to get out of here alive. Uh, I don't think he knows what he's doing. This is not, this is really, the person I know is really, really not there. There, That can be the only explanation to what is happening now. That there's some sort of psychosis, some sort of breakdown, something. And and that is truly uh, horrifying and, and scary. And then the scary part after is when you find out that there wasn't. Right. And, 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 and also, and I think that again, in many of the, and, and, you know, nothing is always the same. And, and a lot of the narcissist stories are, are so similar. And this is very similar to, so, and you'll, you'll realize it later, but, but as opposed to the timelines, if I had, like with most of the stories I hear on your podcast, there was the love bombing and then devaluing almost, you know, fairly early on of, of, of the um, punishment and, and reward, punishment and reward, where this was, this didn't, this, if he had followed that, I, at least I would have been a little prepared and not as devastated and shocked um, if it followed that pattern, if I had some idea of the monster behind the mask. Um, well, 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 that, that, that's, the, that's the thing you just said there, which is uh, there's this monster behind the mask. This monster had been hiding for 15 years that person was always there just <laughs> hiding yeah. and that is that is the truly scary scary part where you know when you when you're looking back now and you're thinking what was true what was what? true and what wasn't and that in Nothing. itself for you and we'll get there has to be uh, so hard to deal with. It's devastating. Yeah. It stole my memories. Uh, when I thought I had 15 years of bliss, I question every second of it. Every second of it. Um, and you'll understand why when I when I tell you other things that I found out. So, but, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of cut you off there. So you... Uh, you, you eventually, you know, never see him again technically until, I guess, court. So what happened after? So he ha- he was gone. And, and again, remember, I also was on this heart medication that was wreaking havoc on my health, besides the fact that my heart was already acting up. So um, he's gone and he's not answering the phone. And I... Um, I was devastated. I um, immediately that month, January, probably dropped 15 pounds. I didn't want to tell anybody because I was ashamed. What if it was me? What if I was crazy? What if I did imagine it? Um, I started joining him on beating on me because he started telling me that, um, well, you're crazy. Um, You're, you know, I can't come home because I, I had to get away from you. But then yet he would also tell me that he had to work. And that was why he was away. Um, he was inconsistent with that. Well, then, then, then come home and talk to me, just please. And he wouldn't talk. And it got to the point where, and I, and I would tell him, you know, my heart was acting up and he wouldn't respond and he didn't care. And that was so not like him when I'm telling him my, my blood pressure just dropped, you know, and my, this, and I had this, it was a really bad, um, winter. Um, with storms, a lot of snowstorms and ice storms, and I had the horses and the chickens and the dogs, and and I say to this day that they kept me alive. I think that if it weren't for them, I wouldn't have gotten out of bed. But I would get out of bed, and um, again, afraid to tell anyone, and I would go and um, out in my pajamas and just you know feed the horses, and um, I I pretty much took to sleeping outside on hammock. We had a porch right out the sliding doors off the bedroom. And I hammock out there, um, 
It is no, because the pain on the outside numbed the pain on the inside. Um, I started beating on myself and just didn't want to live. I didn't know what was happening. Where This man was, he was such a part of me. Um, I ended up calling suicide hotlines because I just, I just felt as if part of me was dead. I didn't know where he was. I didn't know what did I do to cause this wonderful man to be so upset. This man that everybody loved, this good, honest, reliable, responsible, respectable, wonderful man. Um, and he was right. I really believe no one believed me. What did I do to cause him to be so upset to, um, to behave like this? And I blame me. And, um, that was, uh, January and half of February, but. By February, I um, and his text messages to me were back and forth. Were um, would go from I just I just uh, I just need to get away from you, or I'm stuck at work. To then, all of a sudden, he started throwing in like I'm broken and there's something wrong with me, and I believe that, and that caused the the nurture in me to want to help him. Then rather than being angry. Um, and then he would say things like, I'm such, excuse the language, I'm such a fuck up. I fucked everything up. I suck at light. There's something. And that would say, yes, please, honey, please come home and talk to me. We can get through this. Because then I started to think, well, then, you know, maybe it isn't me. Maybe, you know, he did snap. Maybe he has some kind of mental illness or whatever. And um, so I tried to uh, encourage him to come home and talk to me. And, um, and then February mid-February, I decided, let me look on the bank statements. I'm laying in bed. I couldn't sleep. And I opened the bank statements and there it was. Um, thousands and thousands of cash withdrawals um, and um, over $1,500 in flowers in, in about a five or six week period. $100, $150 arrangements. Um, and he never sent, brought me flowers. He knew I loved wildflowers. He would take flowers out of the garden for me. And um, I I um, that that's and then there was also charges for the night that I was in the hospital that he told me that he was going home to get the house ready for Christmas, and he was out of state. He was five hours away, and um, I I called the florists and the credit card numbers, and there were I don't know nine or ten different charges, and um, there were three of them that actually I kind of convinced them. I said I want to make sure I got it to the right address, you know. And um, they told me it was that attorney, the one who uh, pursued me, the one who pursued me and then dropped me when she had everything she needed. Um, and I was I was devastated. But then also, Brendan, I also thought that a sense of relief because it wasn't me. I wasn't crazy. There was someone else, you know, and um, but then again, I also worried for him because when I saw these charges in the hospital, when I was in the hospital of him driving, I equated that to the that that astronaut. You know, you ever hear of the story of the astronaut who drove, who was so madly in love with this man in Texas, and she drove from Florida to Texas wearing a diaper because she didn't want to stop, um, because she was that desperate to get to this man. And my thoughts were, my gosh, how sick is this behavior? I rather than being angry, I was worried that this behavior was so sick because here was this man who truly loved me and I believed he did. Everybody believed he did. Um, and he had a weak moment and maybe he got himself seduced by this woman or whatever and drove through the night to spend three hours in a hotel with her. To screw her in a hotel, excuse me. Well, I'm in the hospital and couldn't reach him to drive back to get back to the hospital on time for the doctor's rounds the next morning. You know, when you do the math, I mean, it's just insane the, the lengths he went to go to see this woman. And um, I started worrying about him, so I called him. And um, he normally didn't answer, you know, that time because I, but at that point, my tone changed. It went from crazy angry to suddenly sympathetic for him. So I was I called and I said, listen, please, honey, call me. I want to talk to you. And I was calm about it um, rather than desperate. And he called and I recorded this call. And and I had confronted him about it. I said, listen, I'm really worried about you. What is, what, you know, if this is what you want, then I'm heartbroken. You know, um, I can't, if you want somebody else, you don't, then tell me. Just be honest. 
but um, no, 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 you know, you, you know, and he started saying things. It was weird. I never heard this expression before. You think I'm a whore master. I was like, what are you even saying? What is this word? What is this phrase? And I said, you know, where were you when I was in the hospital and you told me you were getting the house ready for Christmas? And he said, um, uh, 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 he just he was clearing his throat and he, I let it go on. And then I asked him again and he said, uh, I, I don't remember. I, I don't recall. I said, how can you not recall? I mean, you, and then he said, well, uh, I, I took a drive. I took an innocent drive. How would it, I said, you tell me, you know, how innocent is that? And then he said, well, I, I, I had to, uh, I, she was just a friend and I needed to talk to her about our marital problems. What marital problems? We didn't have any marital, you never told me we had marital problems. I, you were, as far as I was concerned, and I look at all, the, I look back on the, our text messages and, and the, the funny thing is I, I, I never deleted our te- my text messages. I just never did. I always had, because I'm a photographer, I had a phone with a lot of memory on it. And I just never did. I'm lazy. So I mean, I can go back and look. Is there something I'm forgetting? He was making me question reality. This joyful life that we had, the love, the, 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 the our, 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 our honeymoon vacation. Um, every, and he's saying, I had to get away from, you know, our horrible marriage. Said, what are you talking about? I mean, I'm even looking, I look at pictures. I look at the children. I, you know, everything. This was joy. And you never told me, well, there's some, ever since my mother died, something in me snapped, something in me snapped. And, um, I, I don't know. I just need to just, I just need to fix me before I can fix us. And I said, but what is this other woman? Nothing. It's nothing. That's nothing. Um, and, and, um, I'm, I'm crazy. I'm imagining it. So, um, I eventually got to the point where I, I did send her um, an email and I was very, um, reticent about it. I was hesitating. And I said, listen, um, our, our agreement for your, the use of my photos on your website has expired. Okay. Um, I, it has come to my attention that, um, my husband has more than paid you for your time on my case and to use my family, my husband, my, my, you know, any further is just incredibly inappropriate. And I want these pictures down off your website, you know? And um, she took them down, the ones of my children and uh, my friend, but not the one of him. And um, that bothered me, but I I had enough to worry about. But, I mean, just the thought of the two of them sleeping together and asking me to take these pictures is just so tiny and just so... But anyway, um, so fast forward, January and February come and go, and um, he had been telling me um, throughout... The, uh, those two months, um, he would go from telling me he had to get away from me. It was confusing me. The text messages of him being, uh, you know, I suck at life. I'm broken to, uh, you know, you're imagining this. I'm just stuck at work. You don't understand to um, this other person was just somebody I confided in. And the flowers were to thank her for um, work she did on cases. Well, you never sent flowers. And if you did, you would use the union card. Um, and, you know, that I was crazy. And so then um, the way he loved me was not me, the way you and I understand what love is. To a narcissist, love is interchangeable. It's like a car. You can change a car and you can say, oh, I love that car. But you really, you know, you get to know when you forget about it. But human emotion can't just do that. Um, uh, But a narcissist can. They can change families like a movie set. Um, They can, you know, like an actor on a movie set. This is, and but he wanted this. This, he, this continued perception, um, of, of the perfect, of, you know, I, when I read about narcissism, it's, you know, they want to have their, a lot of times their ego, they want to be perceived as the smartest, the one with the perfect love, the perfect wife, the perfect home, the perfect family. That's what he wanted. But, and then here was this better, you know, this, this attorney with millions of dollars and lots of money. Um, 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 she did. And, um, you know, fake boobs and 15 years younger and, the perception of power, because she was work. She worked in his industry, and 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 I'll, I'll tell you a, a little about that in, in a second. But I just want to get back to with um, him him being gone, and and so I sent another. This is the second email I sent to this attorney, this woman, and I said to her, "Listen, um, I know what's going on. I know all about the flowers, the hotels. I know what's happening. Um, uh, you know, you 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 destroyed a wonderful family." Um, uh, I have children who considered him their dad, grandchildren who considered him their papa, their hearts are broken. You should be ashamed of yourself, you know, just back off. 
And um, she responded to me on, you know, in on her legal letterhead, basically telling me that I was crazy. Um, you're imagining things, you, you know, you're pathetic. Um, really, Judy, dot, 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 seriously? Um, uh, you know, you're out of your mind. We're nothing but work associates. You're crazy. I feel sorry for you. You're pathetic. Do not ever contact me again. And that sent me reeling because I figured for sure if he was with her, you know, she'd be angry to hear that we're marriage counseling, we're together. Um, and I, I started questioning all over again. And, um, so it continued. That was April, May, all of a sudden, um, May, my daughter's getting married, uh, a few days before the wedding. I get a message from him because he, he'll still text me now. He didn't call. He would text me. Um, and he said, I was just terminated. And I said, what? Why? Why were you terminated? He said, my picture on her website, um, because of the industry and like in, in his position, it gave the illusion of endorsement. And, um, I, that's not my job to do that conflict of interest check. That's hers. And she's an attorney. She should have known, but it wasn't just that I later found out, you know, they, they supported me when he was dying. They sent a team to the house to make the house wheelchair accessible. So I can keep him up. And they saw, they were flaunting this affair while he was away, um, in the, in the winter and they were disgusted by it. They, they kept saying, I, I heard that the president of the company was walking around saying, how could he do this to Judy? How could he do this to her? You know, um, and they fired him. And um, that was in May. A few days later was my daughter's wedding. And he kept saying he was coming. And he never showed up. My daughter, I guess she knew at that point. See, as I had told you, I had isolated myself. I didn't tell anybody. And I, and I actually didn't. Um, when we were on social media, for example, very public and out there, suddenly I went silent. And people started looking for me. And my local friends, my horse friends. And I wouldn't answer the door. I wouldn't answer the phone. And um, by then, by May, June, I was probably down 40 pounds. That's how thin I was. My girlfriend came to the door, took one look at me and broke down. She said, I look like a head on a stick. That was her description of me. Um, but that's how, that's how broken I was. Um, I was worried about my health physically. Um, I ended up actually even overdosing on my heart medication because I lost so much weight. We didn't realize, you know, and, and so I wasn't on the right dosage. And, um, Anyway, so the text continued. He, he didn't show up. He said he was, he started texting me that he was embarrassed and afraid of people hating him um, because I had lied to them and told them all about this affair. And that was why he didn't come to the wedding. And, um, and the text actually started to escalate from him throughout that time of, um, I would get in the middle of the night, I think of you always. I miss everything about you. I miss making the bed with you in the morning. I love you so much. You're the most wonderful woman in the world that, what did I, you know, I, I, what did I do to make you so upset with me? And, you know, this never happened. And, um, but why, you know, please, please don't file for divorce. And I would go from, um, come home. I love you. All right. Let's work on this too. Then he'll say he was going to come home and he wouldn't show up to me just getting angry and throwing the phone and saying, that's it. I'm going to file for, I don't know what else to do. I see the bank account dwindling, but he was paying all the bills. I was able to take care of the horses and the animals. But, you know, but I'm going to file for divorce because I don't know. You're not going to come. This is this is eight, nine months. Where are you? What's happening? And he, please, 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 Judy, please don't do this. I love you so much. I promise I'll be home tomorrow. I'll be home tomorrow. And then he was telling me he was sleeping on the floor out of state at this other house that we owned out of state working manual labor jobs for food. Um, my heart is breaking. I'm sending friends out looking for him. And they're saying to me, Judy, Judy, listen, please just let go. I said, no, he's, he's he, this poor man. He made a mistake and he, he, um, he, he's, he lost his home, his family, his job. He has nothing. And he's, you know, destitute living on the floor. And I'm worried that he's suicidal. Right. And um, July 7th, my phone rings. And it's her. And I answered the phone and she tells me it's her. And I, I called her every name in the book and I hung up and um, the phone rings again. It's her again. And I hung up again and excuse me. And then I get a ding on my iPad and I open my iPad and it's an email from him. And I open it up and it says, Judy, it's me, your lawyer. Um, he's here with me. I want to help you with your divorce. And I'm thinking, what in the world is going on here? You know, at this point, I, I thought that he was, 
he was destitute on the floor someplace else. And, um, and I called her, but I instinctively took my phone and put it on speaker and grabbed my iPad and put it on the court. And, um, I recorded the whole thing. And basically, um, the reason she called me was, um, she had found, and she told me he was with her. Um, she told me everything. She told me they had been together for a year. So now, um, this is since even before Vegas, um, this was before our anniversary, um, honeymoon. This was while she was representing me. She said they just celebrated their one year anniversary. She told me, um, disgusting details of their sex life. I mean, I, I, I think the reason for that was because I think she's sick too. I think, I think he met his match, you know, but, um, he walked in and she, and the two of us confronted it. And all of a sudden he went from the night before the night before the night before for, for months before of, of, of Judy, I love you so much and professing his love to suddenly you're right. I lied to you. I lied to protect her from you so that you wouldn't file a bar complaint or a lawsuit for, um, um, uh, file adultery because in our state you can file for adultery. Um, and, um, I was hoping the year would go up. What do you mean? Because if you go a year separated, um, it's an uncontested divorce, um, as opposed to, um, claiming for adultery. And I said, no, you know, that doesn't work that way. You don't just disappear and gaslight somebody and lead them on and tell them I'm coming home. I'm coming home. I'm coming home. I'm on a way of business and then able to get an uncontested divorce because you weren't able to drag it out. You know, it doesn't work that way. And, um, you know, who are you? What's, you know, and, and, this went on, um, the conversations. And finally I said to her, I said, you know, why did you do it? You knew we were married. You knew you were my attorney. You knew this is devastating to me. This cost me everything. Um, and why did you make the choice to sleep with my husband? And she said, well, I can't talk to you anymore. I, I, if you have any other questions, you have your attorney call me. I said, I will end the bar. And, um, I made it clear to her that I was going to file the bar complaint anyway, regardless. But after I said that it was the bar that I was calling the bar, I realized She's got to be panicking because she, if he comes home, she'll, you know, and tells the truth, that's trouble for her, right? She needed him to lie for her. And he said on those calls that he was lying for her. He was lying to protect her and he would lie and continue to lie to protect her. And, um, so right after that, the next day, um, they started posting publicly about their affair about their relationship and they were going to get married. I'm thinking, well, that's crazy. We're not even divorced. We didn't even file for divorce. This is crazy. Why would he do that? And, um, but then also all of a sudden everything was cut off. The, um, the, the, the bank accounts, I went to withdraw some cash. I went to use the credit card. Everything was stopped. Um, where our credit was meticulous at that point. Both of us had excellent credit. All of a sudden, everything was gone. No, I had nothing. I never worked. I'm, I'm, my heart was acting up. I had this burden of this farm, the horses. The job alone was, you know, it was a full-time job taking care of the farm. Um, it was hard for me to do that and even do my photography. Um, but now this emotional mind screwing that they're giving me, um, I didn't know what was happening. And, um, I had nothing. I had absolutely nothing left. So that winter, so I went to a lawyer. I filed for divorce um, on grounds of adultery. We were going to also, um, after that was done, there was another attorney who was in the practice who was going to um, sue her for um, um, breach of fiduciary duty and, um, you know, uh, um, I don't even remember for... for um, what, you know, for what she, her part in all of this, you know, manipulating this and because I lost everything. All of a sudden the farm was gone. I had invested everything I had into the house. I had nothing. And, um, and so the one attorney who took me for the divorce, cause I had no money. Um, I, I was able to sell some things and I gave him a $3,000 retainer and he said, don't worry, you know, because this is adultery and clearly he's going to have to pay my fees. So don't worry about it. Um, and a month later after that, my phone rings and it's him. And, um, I answer the phone and this time I, it was an unidentified out of state number and I knew it was got to be from him, but I was out in the barn with the horses and, um, I answered the phone and he was crying saying, Judy, I never meant for this to happen. I never meant this. I'm so sorry, but what's going on? She's holding me blackmail. She's blackmailing me. Well, what do you mean she's blackmailing you? 
you know, well, she said she's pregnant. And if I, and if I even think of going back to you, I would lose everything, um, that you're going down, that you're going to lose your house, your business, your horses, everything is going to be gone. And there'll be nothing to come home to. And I'm afraid of her. I don't know what she's capable of. She's dangerous. She has guns. She has, you know, she's a very dangerous person and I'm terrified of her. And I was, I was frightened. Uh, I was on my way to meet my friends for lunch that afternoon, but I, I called them and said, I can't leave. I, I, I had my computer because I had the conversations on the computer. I was hiding in the trunk of the car because he's telling me this woman is crazy and she was, and I, she was going to be after me and be careful of what she was going to do. And he said, he begged me to come home. Let me come home. And I said, listen, I don't know what to believe from you. Right now, at this point, um, you had um, you had gaslit me. You lied about this relationship, and then you were with her, and then not. And now you're telling me that you were there because you were afraid, and she's been blackmailing you. I don't know what to believe. I said, "Listen, do me a favor. Go to your sisters, pull yourself together, and then call me tomorrow. Let me think on this." You know, I, I'm not about to make any life changing decisions at this point. I already filed for divorce. Oh, because I said to him and turned the credit cards back on him. He said, What do you mean? I didn't do that. I didn't turn the credit cards off. She did. She did that. I didn't. She turned the credit cards off. You know, she took the, she cleared out the bank accounts. It was her. It wasn't me. It was her. And, um, um, I believed it. It was very believable. And, um, I told him I wasn't going to take him back because he, he had said that she had thrown him out. They had gotten in a fight the night before. Um, and she threw him out and that he was calling me from a hotel, um, on a, on a throwaway phone. And, um, and, and I, I never would have known that, you know, obviously had he not called me and, and that was it. But then a few days later, um, had it, cause I'm having to look and people say to me, why do you look on social media? Why do you even do that? Well, because he wasn't sending support at that point, because then I had an emergency hearing for him to send support. I had a whole farm of animals that needed to be fed. I needed my medication. And um, I didn't know where he was. And so I had to go on, and they knew, you know. And so I would see back on Facebook that they're together. But now they're flaunting it, and they're um, – there, she's posting all these things. Um, you know, the song Jolene, Jolene, mm-hmm. you're so beautiful. And you, you know, she posted every single possible Jolene uh, version, um, and laughing at me and f- posting things, um, that were clearly meant for me. The day they got the discovery, she posted, um, I just got a discovery for a divorce that I have a tertiary involvement in. Bring it on. And a picture of herself with an assault rifle. Okay. Um, I, I felt very threatened. Um, I was, and he had warned me that I was going to lose everything. And what happened was I, I started to lose everything. Um, I, you know, fast forward, we went through the divorce. I was, I, I had to go pro se. I had this $3,000 to put on this attorney. He had an attorney. Um, he, um, come to find out that, uh, his attorney informed my attorney right away that his plan was to file bankruptcy. And I later find out that that's, that's a tactic to get the other attorney to back off. And, and that's what he did. He knew that he was not going to get paid. So he basically said, you know, you have to settle this for basically nothing. Or, and he dropped off. Um, and then I had, um, uh, I was able to get another attorney for another month or so. Um, and it was because he had warned me. He said, she is a, she knows every dirty trick in the book. She'll make sure you don't have an attorney. She'll make sure you lose everything. She'll exhaust the judges, the courts, everything. And that's exactly what happened. You know, my attorney that I had for another month, you know, would send them these documents and for these, these questions, they, what they call them, the, the interrogatories. And the responses were, well, that is one question. That's five questions and one question and 15, you know, and word salads of just spinning things, um, and just avoiding anything to where my, my money that I had to pay for an attorney was exhausted and I didn't have any money any attorney, right? Because they just wasted the time that way to where I had to then go into the divorce. And, and I did, um, he ended up, um, as I found out right then that before that, that he had used our 401k it was our 401k it was, we were married 15, it was 15 years and it was supposed to be ours, but the way it was worked out with his, the union that he worked at, he was able to take it without me knowing. And they he raked me over the coals. Although I did get the divorce on grounds of adultery. Um, and, and in this state, that meant, um, um, that he had to sign the house over to me. Um, and I was told not to sign, um, not to pay it until he signed the quit claim, which is he's quitting claim to it. He's ordered to sign it, but 
it was a matter of getting him to sign it. And I couldn't get him served because he kept claiming that he was living in the other house. He didn't, he, when he was living with her on 75 acres, 400 miles on the other side of that state, um, with, um, uh, a mile long driveway and a gate. Okay. There was no way to get him served because he denied living there. She denied living there. And so I had to every single month, um, he was ordered to pay support for me for four years. I had no work. I had been out of work and now my health was failing. Um, my heart and uh, my issues with my health. And, um, and I was just dealing with this constant threats against everything. Um, at, at, and um, I, I went to go on the mortgage thing and she's listed as third party contract con- contact. And so I talked to the mortgage company and I explained to them, listen, you know, the house was underwater. Um, can you work with me? And they said, yes, because the house was underwater. They will, um, they'll, they'll, it was affordable. They were going to take enough off the principal and the payments for me to be able to stay in my home. Um, but he had to sign off. And, um, each time I would fill out an application, they would withdraw it because his name was on it. He was allowed to withdraw it. Um, and eventually the house was foreclosed and, um, I was, I lost my home. Um, at one point I got, um, a message on Facebook messenger from this other person that I, that disappeared suddenly said, check out this great new website. I had, I had announced on my Facebook page um, that I was changing my business name back to my maiden name and it was going to be Judy Smith photography now, right? Well, it said, check out this new website, judysmithphotography.com. And I went on the website and I clicked on it and, um, it was disgusting. It was, um, it was awful. It was making fun of, I had told you I had used the animals and these women and just to help these women feel more beautiful, but it was taking pictures of, it was pictures of men in wedding dresses, uh, you know, and just, ha ha, I can make anybody and, and using, they made fun of me because I don't have a college education. I ain't got no college education. And it was soliciting me for sex, soliciting me for bestiality. It was offensive to me, my business. It was just absolutely disgusting. And um, at that point, I started also getting um, emails um, for early burial services. Um, and um, my horses listed for sale and um, I had to rehome them and hide them. I lost my home. I lost my business. Um, I had nothing. I had no way to get money. The, I couldn't even get my health care because he was he was cutting off the health care and my health was deteriorating. And um, I eventually had to leave. And I I moved to a, I moved into a little cottage um, that was barely finished. It had no heat. And I just, it was awful. I, it was, it was a nightmare that just wouldn't stop these attacks and um, continued and continued. And I guess um, what ended up happening to, to make this, you know, to just, so you realize this wasn't just this man who was, he had me believing he was a victim was um, a phone call that I don't even think I told you about in the letter which happened fairly um, soon after the divorce. My phone rang, and it was these three women. And they said, who is it? And it was uh, it was his first wife and his daughters, my stepdaughters, who I had never met. Um, they were adults now. And, um, in fact, when he was dying, my daughter tried to reach out to them, saying, you know, your dad is dying. You know, I know your mother is, you know, maybe she's hard on you or whatever, but, you know, your father's dying. And they never responded. And... Um, they called me and I said, you know, what's, what's going on? And they, uh, they said, we heard what he did to you. And we wanted to tell you that he did the same to us. And I said, wait, what are, what are you talking about? What do you mean? They said, he did the identical thing to us step by step. And I said, um, wait, so what does that make me? The other woman? And, and they said, yes. And I had no idea. I had no idea. And we started putting dates together. And it ends up when he was pursuing me, um, they were still married. They were celebrating their 25th wedding. So, um, I had no idea. Um, he, they were telling her, he was telling her that he was having to work at a state like he did with me. Um, and um, when I told them the story, you know, we exchanged things. I told them about him banging on the door and saying, no one will ever believe you. Um, they gasped. They said, that's exactly what he told them, um, that no one would believe him. And, um, she, she, I have to tell you, um, Randy, when he had said, you know, she was everything that he said she was, wasn't, she was the opposite. Um, 
he had said she was crazy, she was stupid, she refused to work, she was she was mean, she was physically violent, she was she is the most kind, funny, warm, loving, intelligent, hardworking, wonderful woman. We're good friends now. Um he would not let her work. Same thing. He had her believing that he loved her so much and wanted her to be the you know, but then used it against her later. And um um, she said to me, um, Judy, check your lug nuts. I said, what do you mean? He said, um, she said, when he needed me to disappear, he, um, all the lug nuts on my car were missing. And, um, I was, I was just devastated by that. I was like, oh my God, you know, that's, that's crazy. That's crazy. Right. And, um, but then that started me thinking, you know, I look back on text like that night that he had me on the floor with his fist. Right. And he screamed at me and I look at the text and I mean, it was very real. And I was very descriptive in my text messages to him. I said to him that night you had me on the floor. Um, and I'm paraphrasing now, but I have the text where I, I said to him, you know, I, I realized now this was after I had realized he, had, he was in an affair. I said, um, you, you wanted, you needed me gone, but you just didn't know how to do it. And you, I saw this hatred in your eyes and it wasn't for me, Judy, who I am, but it was for me, your wife, because I was your wife and you needed me gone, but you just didn't know how to do it. And I really believed that if you could have, if I didn't get away, you would have killed me that night. And his response was literally, and this, I'm not paraphrasing. I'm so sorry. I'm so very sorry, Judy. That was it. Um, He didn't deny it. He didn't say he didn't. And what, is more worrisome about that though is the next day because that was the day if you remember the next that I ran out and I spent the night in the car the next day was the snowstorm in the generator and that didn't dawn on me until um fairly recently when I'm uh going over writing on a timeline because I'm still dealing with some legal stuff with her um and I'm going over this timeline and I'm having to I'm looking back on my texts and I'm questioning the whole conversation about the generator and all of a sudden now, in retrospect, knowing something I know now that I didn't know then is very frightening. When I moved to this new town to hide, um, I, um, I brought the generator with me, right? And I hooked it up outside of the house that I'm renting. And one of my neighbors said to me, you know, Judy, you can't leave that generator there. And I said, why? And they said, well, because of, um, because of the carbon monoxide, you know, that's a gas generator. And it has to be 20 feet from a house, you know? And all of a sudden, I just, when I'm looking at those text conversations, I realized what was happening. It was the night after he had me on the ground and I really believed he was going to kill me. Um, this is a person whose part of his job was, had to do with carbon monoxide testing and, um, noxious gases in the workplace, right? And, um, why would this man have, um, turned on the generator right outside the bedroom where he, he believed I was sleeping and opened the window and jammed the on-off switch and take the key and go down the, down the driveway for three hours. This is something, you know, when it was happening, it never occurred to me. But now in retrospect, I have no doubt of what that was, you know, um, because I couldn't get it off. And if he really was worried about the house losing power, um, it, um, uh, he wouldn't have used all the gas to just turn on the generator, make sure it worked. He wouldn't have jammed, the on-off switch was jammed and take the key and open the bedroom window. Just the generator was just 12 inches from the bedroom window and um, all the carbon monoxide was coming in. I didn't know about that. I mean, I was naive with that and I never realized that, but I remember getting a headache um from this I thought it was the sound um and I remember saying it was just it was stinky it was noisy and I just wanted to turn it off um but he wouldn't answer me for three hours and um um and then he finally came back and when the gas was almost gone and he turned it off but um I guess it's clear to me because um from that point on, he's, he joins in with these attacks. He has been getting into my healthcare accounts. Um, he knows passwords and, um, I'm just being bullied into silence. I'm trying hard not to. I've been warned not to speak up. Um, that's why I'm really careful with names and specifics on this. Um, I'm still going through it 
partly um, legally, but I think she's, I mean, she's dangerous too. I think, like I said, I think I'm, he met his match. Um, I think after here, oh, because here's the other thing too. Um, when I talked to his first wife, you know, I talked about, um, about him being a minister and they laughed and they said, what? And then, and then being a teacher and they said, what do you mean? You know, he's never a teacher. He failed out of one year of community college. And I said, he was, he went for 15 years. I mean, you know, you're, you're married to someone, you're together with someone. We have had dinner parties and family and friends and whatever. And he would always exchange shop talk about his day's teaching. I had no reason to question, just like I would have no reason to question your name. Um, you know, you, we inher- inherently, we just trust people. And this was this wonderful kind man. He was never a minister. He was never a teacher um, who was this man. For 15 years that I was married to. Um, so, Judy, I have a question. Yeah. Now that we are, you know, here at the end of your story, how are you feeling? Well, I'm, I go from wanting to continue to see this through to get justice because there is this ongoing still to then getting frustrated with it because it's dragging out and just wanting to drop it. But then I feel I feel like if, if I do that, I'm doing myself and Others are disserviced by letting these narcissists, these monsters get away with, you know, not only betraying um, these women, and but destroying their future financially, their homes, their lives, their, um, you know, everything. Um, and that there has to be some kind of justice, you know, but yet, you know, I go on these TikToks and these, you know, and it's like, just, just move on. You're never going to win. You know, you're never going to win with the narcissist. But I have all of the... Uh, because of the specifics of the situation um, that um, she had to produce conversations with them. I mean, uh, I've, I've got everything there. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, I, I don't know. And how is, you know, I guess, your day-to-day as far as, you know, work goes, shelter goes, uh, your support system, you know, your kids, everything like that? Well, they're wonderful. My children, my family. I, I have wonderful support system of friends and family and people who love me. I have just started doing art. I, um, I, when I came here to the beach, I started wandering the beaches and collecting driftwood. And I, before I knew it, I had a driftwood horse created, um, life-size. It's in an art gallery now. Um, I'm, I'm making art. I'm making from my pain a lot of positive, um, uh, my photographs, I'm doing art photography as well as, um, weddings and, but I, I live in fear of, it's not so much, you know, the trust issue. It's not that, you know, I, I, I don't trust anybody. I, the one person that I don't trust any longer is me. That's what's the most broken is I'll go from trusting, saying I have trust issues. I don't trust anybody to, I have trust issues. I'm trusting people I shouldn't trust because I don't trust me to know who I should or shouldn't trust. Because if this man fooled me for 15 years, if he was nothing, I mean, every, it's like a Dateline episode when you're watching it and you're saying, how do you not know? How do you not know? Open your eyes, lady. You know, how did I not know he wasn't a teacher? His family, that was, it goes back to that too. His family then started attacking me saying, I didn't let him in the hospital and I never, and it was all, they are his blind monkeys. They had enabled this. Um, he lived in a small town. Um, he got away with it the one time and they continued to then try to make the whole story repeat itself. Um, it was never, um, that she didn't let him see his family. He really couldn't be bothered with his family, but that's the dynamics of their family. It's weird. They talked about love, but they never showed love. And, um, but I, again, because I trusted this person so completely, every cell of my body, I trusted this man a hundred percent. It's me who I'm having a hard time trusting because I fell for this. I fell for this massive, massive lie. Um, I was just used as a stepping ladder. I guess maybe his ego is to just try to find a bigger and better wife so he can show off this more grandiose, wonderful life and love and home and style that he has. Because now he's traveling the world. He's in this big home and has this wife, 15 years younger, you know, where I was eight years younger and I had, you know, I was an actor and I had, you know, we had this and he just, it's a game to him, I think. You know, trust is going to be a big thing. And for 15 years, you were under 
the perception that everything you heard was real and there's uh, that's something that was presented to you and there was no reason to question it and I, you know, as far as trusting someone again from what you had to deal with specifically that's going to be hard and yeah. You know, because you did nothing wrong and there were no signs and you really had a wolf in sheep's clothing. And that's not even, that's an understatement. Uh, yeah. You know, he... He had the world fooled. He, everybody he, who I talked to feels personally betrayed by him. Yeah, he, he was not just a wolf. I mean, this man, to get out of these situations, was willing to kill you. Yeah, I believe that. And, I have no doubt and how he, lucky we, his first wife and I say every day how lucky we are to be alive. And this next person might not be so lucky. And, uh, you know. I think he met his match in this in one. This one. Yeah. I, do. So, I do. She's. I think she's equally as dangerous if not. I mean, I hate to say that, but um, I have a lot of reasons to believe that. So, you know, trust is going to be really hard. And... Mm -hmm what you had to deal with and you know i know you're struggling going backward trying to just wrap your brain around this this wasn't just one year or two years or three years this was 15 years of a complete lie and that's hard to deal with and you know there's a void that's that's the that's exactly it because it's my my memories were stolen stolen i look back at pictures of when my children the grandchildren were born and i get angry because in videos how do i get him out yeah. of there this fraud i don't have any memories what you know you look back at least in my first marriage i told you we outgrew each other whatever i still look back at joyful happy memories this 15 years when i look back of the bliss that i believed i was living it's more of a, of a nightmare because I didn't know the monster under that mask who was lurking there. And those flashbacks when they happen are most likely a, a jolt that just throw you into yes. complete emotional chaos where it's just hard to, you know, that just boom. And then all of a sudden, whatever is going on that day, it's done. Because the joyful memories aren't joyful when I think of, the, of what I, you know, when I had said it was bliss. But when I look back at that and I say that, I start to shake because it wasn't because it was this dark secret that I didn't know of what was really happening. So are you are you able to get, are you uh, doing therapy with anyone to help you through this? I tried this year and then he cut off my insurance and I didn't have the, the uh so I have it. I have. I rely on things like your website, your, your um, you take talk, other other support groups like this. So, so if if anyone is uh, listening who is a therapist and and uh, wants to take you on, you know, for free, please do uh, do do get a hold of me, and because you know you, what you're dealing with now is 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 very overwhelming and day-to-day uh, -day function you talking to me right now is i uh, is pretty amazing um and that you were able to tell your story uh so so well and, and you know so whoever is listening who is in the therapy field probably an emdr therapist you know to help with being able to go through memories and, and not be re-traumatized, please uh, get a hold of me uh, so we can help you, uh, so we can help Judy. Um, you know, you are a wonderful person who is a selfless human being who got taken advantage of by a real terrible monster. And, um, you know, I, you know, if I don't have words really, like a hug can't do justice, um, what I want, what I want to give you. So, you know, from, from everyone here, you know, we are behind you, whatever you need, we'll be here for you. Thank you. Thank you. 
And if I could, you know, and, and that was how I felt too, is sharing it because it's not like a, a misery loves company kind of thing. It's not, not at all. It, it, I found it helpful because it made me feel less crazy, more, less, um, that, that it wasn't my fault, that this is, is particularly when you see so many similarities in the behavior of the gaslighting, the, the lying, the manipulation, the love bombing, the betrayal, the disposal. It, the pattern just shows that these are monsters or robots and it's just their wiring and it's just the way it is. And we can't personally, that doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. That doesn't mean we're going to struggle with trust and peace and feeling safe. Um, but at least, um, I feel like this was totally out of my control and, and this was, there are, there are, and that's scary too. There are monsters. And in fact, that's, that's one of the sad things. One of my grandsons who adored him, you know, said, uh, to my daughter, did Papa die? And she said, what do you, what do you mean? Did Papa die? You know, why would you, we didn't know what to tell them at first because he just disappeared. And, and he said, Papa loves me so much. If Papa was alive, he would want to see me. And um, my daughter, Angel, she went to a counselor and we discussed how to handle this. And it's probably best because there are monsters. The worst monsters are the real ones that look like us, right? Those are the ones that you would be afraid of. Not the big, ugly, scary ones with the big gnarly teeth and the, you know, and the crazy eyes. The ones that look safe, those are the ones, those are the real monsters. And how do you tell a four-year-old at that point he was four, you know, that one of the safe people, we tell, teach kids, you know, if you ever were afraid or frightened, or lonely or scared, you can go to mommy, daddy, grandma, papa, you know, um, how do you tell them one of the safe people really was not safe? Um, it's better to let them believe that papa died and um, that's what they believe. Because he just disappeared from their life. He ghosted them too. Mm. He ghosted everyone. And um, So before we end off uh, our show today, uh, are there any words of uh, wisdom or advice that you have for everyone listening? Um, I think to talk about it is, is to, and, and I think it's really, really important. What kept me going, kept me alive, was that I did feel, don't not let yourself feel it. I find it, and to talk, I... And, and here's just one, one kind of see, silly thing is I, I actually posted about it on Facebook. I had gone silent for a while and, um, and then people were looking for me. And finally, I didn't want to have to tell my story again and again and again. And cause everybody loved our love. Right. And so I, I made a public post and I, I didn't like, I don't like to air dirty laundry, but I said, listen, people have been looking for me and asking if I'm okay and wondering where I've been. I suddenly went silent. And here's the truth. Um, I'm not okay. And this is why he's gone. Um, you know, I said that he was working a lot and, um, he was telling me how much he loved and missed me. But apparently when he was home, he was telling someone else the same thing and he broke my heart. They both did. And I'm going to need you all to understand and to be here for me and understand if I go quiet and to help me through this. And Brandon, I can't tell you that is one of the best things I did. Um, one, it was brave. It took a lot of bravery. Um, and it wasn't airing dirty laundry. People have to realize that. And what it did was people who love me wanted, they were, thank God you told us, why didn't you, you know, we want to be there for you. And, and so as when you ask, do I have a support system? When I tell you I have a support system, it is, it's just, I'm just, I'm surrounded by love with so many people who love me and care for me and are happy that I made it through this much. And I'm very grateful for that. And um, so to reach out and to feel the feelings, don't deny them. I let myself be sad, but then I say, then tomorrow I'm going to, I'm going to get up and face the world again. But, um, you know, feel it and on family too. I think, I think I, there were definitely a lot of signs in his family. Um, and the family dynamics and the interesting way that they, so I think look at that too, but I think talking about it and that's why I wanted to do this too, is to, it's not airing dirty laundry. It's not being unable to get past. It's not holding a grudge. And, and, and there's just one other, uh, another thought too is forgiveness. Forgiveness does not mean forgetting. 
that was another thing I struggled with. You don't have to forgive and forget. To forgive is for us. Um, I can say I forgive. I don't even know if I forgive them. But other things, you can forgive certain things, but that's just because you're not going to, I don't seek revenge. That means I'm not going to seek revenge. I'm not going to, um, but it's, it doesn't mean that you're not going to get justice. It doesn't mean that it's okay. Forgiveness doesn't mean any of that. Forgiveness just means you're not going to go on the attack. Um, but you can still get justice. You can still have, have, um, you still always have a dog bites. Always remember that dog is capable of biting. You have to, you don't just say, I forgive it. And I'm going to go right back in his face. Um, I can forgive the dog, but I'm not going to forget that that dog is capable of biting. Well, Judy, I want to thank you for being here with all of us today and sharing your story. You, you know, after listening to everything, uh, you know, it's just amazing that you were able to be here to tell your story. Um, You're brave is an understatement. You know, you are going to be remembered on the show for a long time. Um, And you're going to help a lot of people in the process, you know, of of what you did today. So thank you so much from the, the bottom of my heart. And for everyone listening from, from Judy and I, we hope you have a good night.